formal pedagogies of critical conscious and social action. I originally had three, but I think just because we're going to do breakout rooms and come back, I'm going to pick just two. So we'll focus on problem posing and also dialogue or dialogical. And then if we have time, we'll do practice. So sort of those are the three main learning outcomes for today. Um, what I invite us to do is we have so many seasoned folks that are here in the workshop. Um, I saw the survey responses and then knowing from some of you is my hope is that this is the beginning of a conversation with people together, but also a, a continuation of your reflection. And so please chime in as, as you wish and as needed. Um, and that chiming in and that wishes and needed is sort of thinking about our practices and principles together. So some, some ones that the students talk about with me is sort of make space, take space, take away stories and not names. And then I'm inviting you to use the Zoom chat to respond or pose questions or amplify. And then Warren is, is kindly um, assisting, co-learning, co-facilitating with this as well. Um, and then you should have access to the Google Docs link. Um, and maybe Warren may ask you to put it in the chat just in case if someone isn't able to access it. If you're not able to access it, we can have workarounds. So please just signal to Warren and myself. Um, thank you, Warren, for your help yeah, with that. I, I appreciate that. Uh, Kathy, I don't actually have the link itself um, because I just have the invite um, and I don't have editing access. So maybe if you have, I can, I can try to grab it, but. Um, no, 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 that's good. This is all good. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me just put it here. Oh, I put it in. Oh, thanks, Linda. <laughs> See? Thanks, Linda. Co-learning group process. Woohoo! Yay! Um, so it's in the um, chat, courtesy of Linda Lamb, director of Capus at Pitzer, um, and a colleague at CGU as well. So I thought it would sort of might be useful just to talk a little bit about what does anti-racist mean because it can have it can have different meanings for different folks, um, and really thinking about um, not racist versus anti-racist, right, on that spectrum. And I was thinking about this in terms of the public health discipline of upstream and downstream factors. Um, what's really interesting is we're offering these series of workshops, or sorry, CTL is offering these series of workshops. I took credit for something that I didn't do, and I'm a participant, but it's, you know, in the context of a White House executive order about diversity, equity, inclusion. So I was kind of, I was musing over like, well, would this be allowed? Like, would this workshop be allowed in this criteria? So these questions about what it means to be not racist, anti-racist is very live, both policy, community, and individual at this time. So I was thinking, of the difference of not racist versus anti-racist. And here are phrase, phrases that have come up in different meetings that I've been in um, and different um, settings when there's been incidences of, of, of the world asking us to think about what does it mean to be not racist and anti-racist. So I'd love for you to take a brief moment to read through them and then um, feel free to unmute and say something like in terms of what do you notice or what is your reaction to these comments? So you can put in the chat. You're also welcome to unmute and speak. And again, it, the idea is it's not about shaming. It's not about perfection. It's not like the super prize for the best anti-racist person ever. It's more about let's sort of think about the field in which there might be some nebulous phrasings and terms, and then how do we have clarity and community as we come up together with, with, with concepts and strategies. So I'm seeing in chat, let's see. Yep, so I see the burden is placed on others, responsible to others, so there's, thank you for that. So Tamara, Mary, yep, Julie, yep. So this idea of there's, there's a, can be some distancing, there's about a question of agency, like who has the agency. There's also an element of passivity, right? Um, so we're getting this sort of proactive versus reactive. There's also something about the scale right, of, of an individual action versus context and sort of the social condition. 
So that takes us into the river parable. Um, and, and if folks are familiar with the public health field, this parable is used often in terms of thinking about health inequities. Um, so the story that can be used, and I'm shifting and changing it, is let's say there's a couple that wants to go fishing. And the couple is Loris and Meisha. And Loris and Meisha decide to go fishing. They leave their house, they go on a bridge, they walk down the, across the bridge, they go to the river. And as they walk down the river to find a favorite fishing spot, they see tons of trash at the bottom of the river. And the question is, how do Dolores and Misha deal with the trash? And a not racist approach might be like downstream, we're just gonna clean up the trash, right? So you see that in, that, in, in those quotes too, right? Like if you have, if something comes up, come and talk to me, like it, it appears like there's, there's trash. A midstream approach might be, well, let's prevent trash by putting signs like please don't litter or let's put more trash cans. And then a more sort of proactive anti-racist approach would be more systemic. Well, let's think about us producing trash and how do we produce trash as a whole, right? So if we were to compare that with thinking about um, oppression, we might think about COVID-19 or heteropatriarch is more systemic, like upstream back at the back at the bridge when Mesa and Lord has started walking to the fishing versus downstream is more individual when trash appears. Like, let me just write this my syllabus. Let me talk about this in my office hours or classroom techniques. So it's interesting the term anti-racist pedagogies if we expand it conceptually and think about all the ways that we, we are engaging with it not only for us as an individual with our class, but us with other entities like CAPIS or other ARC or Empower Center accommodations, but then also the social conditions that shape us as faculty, staff, librarians, as well as our, the communities that we're engaging with in terms of our students and their communities as well. So just sort of a, a framing of thinking about these upstream factors that shape learning and that the techniques may focus on individual, but how do these techniques or pedagogies also engage with these upstream factors? So an other way to think about these examples is these are some stats that I pulled from various sources, the Atlantic, et cetera. You can just take a moment and, and, and look through them and you can sort of think about, well, let's take a moment and read through them. And invite you to take breath, find your grounding, because these are not easy stats. And so it's an interesting way if we take a downstream approach that's individual, that's with our office hours, that's with our syllabus, with classroom teaching techniques, then we lose some things, right? So the stat of nearly one in three Black Americans in the U.S have had a first-hand experience with a COVID-19 death is a really big statement. My throat is catching, right? And then if we have a, a, a interpolation of things that happen around whiteness and blackness and around um, health inequities, those impact various um, ways in which our students show up, we show up, our community partners show up. So I'm offering this, musing about thinking about anti-racism as critical consciousness and social action. This is a picture of Paolo Ferry. CTL had a, a um, what was it? No Stress, No Worries book club. It was such a great title. Maybe it was so inviting. Like, I'm going to show up. That was so great. So they had one, I think, on Pedagogy of Freedom. So this is sort of bridging that. Um, I was very lucky to be, in, to be inspired and mentored by various scholars like Michael Okazar Ray and Michael James who worked with Ferry and then um, continued to work with uh, lost grad students like me in ethnic studies. So I, I have a framing of ethnic studies and feminist studies approach and thinking about critical consciousness and social action as the purpose of education and thinking about it in terms of um, um, how do we approach anti-racism, not just the strategies and techniques, but also a framing. So 
those upstream factors is also about relationality. So that the, the, the task of teaching and learning isn't just transactional. It isn't just content delivery, delivery received. There's, there's a relationality to the knowledge and also to each other. And there's an element of liberatory, a liberation, right? There's an, an element of transformative change. Um, so that was a lot. And, and we sort of went through upstream and downstream in relation to the river parable and trying to link anti-racism with upstream and downstream. And then thinking about critical conscious social action as, as sort of um, an anti-racist approach. So if you go to the Google Doc, I'm gonna invite us to spend some time sort of weaving together what things that are we interested in, what questions pop up for us. Um, thanks for coming back. It was very exciting <laughs> to see. I know Esther, right? It is an option to not come back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm I not <laughs> <laughs> and feel free to keep on typing. I just noticed, like, it's just exciting. More and I are excited to see, like, the dots and the like things being populated. Like, what word is gonna come next? <laughs> so, um, I think if people continue to come back, I just invite you to to spend some time with the group notes um, and just sort of see what were some of the thoughts and musings and questions and brilliant ideas that people shared. And then we're just gonna have a little bit of time for an open large group discussion and engagement. <clears throat> And as you read the group notes, you're invited to highlight words and phrases in bold or underline, or put in, in parentheses like yes or question. So engage with it as a text. We'll do this for a minute or two to sort of see how we're thinking as a group. And if you didn't get to finish your thought, feel free to, to extend more. Thank you, Julie. Yes, so Julie is an amazing model of using the comment feature on the blog, which I have still learning my tech muscles. So, so welcome. Um, I think someone chimed in, maybe it was Andre. We're looking at a Google Doc together. We've just been small groups. And um, and we're just reacting to the Google Doc we shared. Uh, and let me just see. The Google Doc we'll put in chat. And we're just reflecting on racism versus, or not racist versus anti-racist and the upstream downstream concepts and critical conscious and social action. What is it, what, how does it land for us? And, what are we yearning for? Or what are we inspired by? And we have a spacious five plus minutes for this. So you can take your time with the collective document, engaging it with each other. And the type of facilitator I am is I have a scaffolding, a structure, but I don't always rigidly adhere to it if there's a need for more time. So just know that that's also a choice and an option too. Um, What 
themes are you noticing? And it could be either, it could be in the Google Doc or it could just be an internal question that you're noticing also. And because we're coming from a range of disciplines and a range of institutions with different social ecologies for the different institutions, these different ways that we engage with each other consortially, like if we're from the library or from CGI, thinking about our different positionalities, um, grad students or the center director, Maybe we're staff faculty teaching combo, um, admin position, maybe we're a postdoc somewhere, or we're adjunct and now we're tenure track. Or there's, there's a range in which we, our different positionalities have different lenses and similar lenses. a minute or two. I'm going to shift gears to invite someone to unmute. And let's hear some voices other than my voice of things you noticed or things that um, stood out to you or questions that you have. I'd love to. So you're welcome to unmute them and share out to the group. It's just a little bit sonically. Um, well, and, now, and now our group, we're talking about, uh, hi everybody, about um, how the James Baldwin um, quote reminds us about the role of education is not just reproducing knowledge. The role of education is to create critical citizens. And the picture that you posted with Paulo Freire, that's actually what he's saying in Portuguese. I, I translated it in the chat. He's saying, well, education doesn't change the world. Education changes people and people change the world. And that is um, coming from Latin America and of course being a big <laughs> Paulo Freire fan. Um, I'm always amazed at the fact that US academia is so isolated from the rest of society. In the developing world, you don't have that luxury, you know. So, for instance, when I learned the concept of public sociology, when I came, when I came to the U.S., I was like, "What is that?" Like, of course, sociology is public, <laughs> of course, because we're always doing that. Like, sociologists in Latin America are always engaging with the public, are always participating in public debates about problems, about you know, policy solutions, and all that. But here in the U.S., it's more difficult to have that conversation. Ironically, because academia has more resources. So uh, it's, it's so interesting to see that several of the themes that we are talking about um, here and that are reflected on, on the Google Doc are connected to that need, I guess. And there's so much there, Esther. So thank you for that. Um, there's so much there in terms of the ways we can be siloed and both in terms of geographically, but that also then comes with it an epistemological siloing, right? Whether it's mind or body and spirit or whether it's the different purposes of education, the different roles. And so I love your framing of, but what if the epistemological center is everything is integrated for the purpose of transformation? And that could be linguistically language ideologies, that could be the ways in which, what, what texts we, we use, um, so I had this amazing mentor this summer at the CTL Institute and poor Jessica had to meet me like three days in a row. We went through our whole syllabus, but she just had that framing of like care and choices, but that was always in that context of everything is integrated. That was, that was just a shift. So thank you, Jessica, for the coaching this summer. <laughs> so I think Mary or Julie were unmuting. Did I see some other unmutes, other comments building either upon Esther or offering a comment of your own? I'm, I'm super grateful to being in a breakout group um, with a young scientist, <laughs> with Cho, um, because we talk about being downstream and wanting to get upstream. And there's, there's work that I think a lot of us have done in the middle, but it's that higher one where we get really frustrated. Like, what the hell can we do up here? Sorry. Um, and Joe had this great, because I was saying like my biggest thing that gets me is that 
I can tell my students grades don't matter and I can help them learn that we want to learn and then they apply to med school and it all matters and I'm constantly angry with med I'm constantly trying to work with my colleagues around this and can we ungrade can we whatever and Joe just very wisely said like why haven't you written an article that goes in the New England Journal of Medicine and that forced them to pay attention to the fact that there's inequities that those those first semester grades are always like they're never going to be a good judge of anything and you have to stop requiring them and I thought well yeah that's activism right and that is something that I could do and I could get a bunch of colleagues to sign on to and so now I feel really motivated because he gave me this idea of how do I get to that upstream thing where I feel like I don't have any agency so you're all going to sign on when I get to it <laughs> <laughs> so should we just end the workshop now and just wait until everyone agrees to sign on? We will not continue. So, but that's beautiful, Joe and Mary, in terms of power. It's about power and agency. And then what do we lose and what do we gain based on where we, we look of upstream, midstream, and downstream? Um, thank you, thank you. Julie, were you going to say something? I'm uh I'm so grateful to this, to everybody here. And I feel like I found my people. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and I've been searching, I've been searching for all of you. <laughs> yeah. And um, so I really love that the, the upstream and the downstream analogy. And I feel like a lot of us, and yeah. um, I'm grateful to Esther for helping me uh, realize this too, that I think we're all in the downstream and we're just trying to figure out how to swim upstream. And I like Joe's suggestion to Mary. Um, and now I'm just itching to like, okay, let's let's start. Like we're all in agreement that there's a problem. So like, what do we do? And I'm tired of um, changing myself and adapting myself and trying to be the example and blah, blah, blah. And that's great. But I want, I wish my colleagues were here. Um, I teach at KGI and, um, and I know this is being recorded. So I would tell, say it very lovingly that I wish my colleagues were here with me too. Mm. And thank you, Julie, for the reminder that this is a public document and most likely be public, so it's important to note. And also that naming, it isn't just a teacher on student, it's bi-directional teacher with student, but it's also us as faculty, staff, and as community members that were in the social ecology, we're in the upstream thing, and that is impacting us. So it isn't just if we write the perfect statement in the syllabus about my open hours, which I learned from Esther at the summer CPL, that's going to solve all oppression, right? That is going to immediately move us to liberation. So thank you for that. And, and it's really important to have these containers and these building communities. Um, and, and Paolo Ferri talks a lot about in terms of rural peasants in um, Brazil, but then very influenced social movements of the 60s, which woven in with ethnic studies, but also then it influenced the labor movement, influenced critical pedagogy, which was Peter McLaren and others. So there were all these different sectors, but, but as they were in different sectors, they talked about the need for community. And we often say we need community, but it's like this ways in which we can have the practice of reflection and action and dialectically go back and forth and back and forth with each other. So this is why the CTL is modeling some important things because you can see they're always bringing us together in different ways. So that is a perfect, Julie, I'll thank you later. I'll bring you passion fruit from my vines later in a socially distanced way because it's moving us to actionable pedagogy. And I'm gonna focus on thinking about problem posing and also dialogue. And while this, I'm talking about this in the context of teaching and classes, I also sort of stuck in things that I did when I was an administrator and Carlos Alvarez is on this call. And he, it's really important that he's on this call because he and I co-created this together with many other people like Linda Lamb, Leah Herman, other people on this call in terms of thinking about problem posing and dialogue for the, the whole college or the consortium as well. So it's sort of tying into Julie's comment. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about problem posing um, in a couple of ways. Um, first, I thought I'd do it conceptually. Um, and oh, well, I would do talk about it as a concept and then I would give you examples of what, what I do in a classroom. So let me just find this. 
So and what we'll do is I'll talk about it as a concept, give you some examples that I've used, and please chime in and share examples that you use because there's so many important practitioners here. And then we'll have a quick break, and then I'll talk about dialogue, concept, practice, and then we'll have a breakout. And then you can leave in some practices you're already doing or thinking about or things that you'd like to do. Um, okay. Close your eyes as I figure out the screen sharing piece. So you don't get dizzy by me traveling back and forth. Okay. So in terms of proactive and reactive pedagogies, I was thinking about what, what, what can we do um, that's engaging with these upstream and downstream factors. So um, what I have here is a quote from Margo Olkazar Ray, who is a, a significant feminist scholar, um, Asian American Studies, we're including the Department of Asian American Studies. We have a, a Margot Okazare Summer Social Justice Fellowship. I think it's in its 11th or 12th year. Um, she has worked on a global uh, scale in terms of thinking about anti militarism and feminism. And um, we were just in conversation talking about a potential project. I was like, oh, this is perfect for the workshop. And you can see there's thematically similar things with Freire and also with James Baldwin. So I'll give you a moment to pause and read it. So this is Margot, oops, Margot in the orange right here. So the second to the left of the screen. And here's the good news. She's moving to Pilgrim Place in December. So she is so excited to be in conversation with CPL and continue with Asian American Studies. Um, and she, whenever she comes to her report box for her scholarship, where students do community engaged projects, um, she engages with staff and faculty and students. So we're really excited that she's coming. So what you can see in this quote is if we are to use a sort of more evidence-based positive, positivist lens is, there's questioning the self, like attitudes, values, and habits, right? And then interweaving, I think Esther or someone put in the sociological imagination, like the weaving of history and biography. But I think what's interesting is in this quote, in problem posing and framing it as an anti-racist practice of taking into account social conditions like upstream factors is a complex relationship. This is also what Ju Julie talked about. And then getting at the root causes of oppression, like poverty, heteropatriarchy. And it's the basis of that seeing and knowing and understanding and naming those contractors and those relationships that is the basis for critical thinking as well as action. So the action piece is really important here. So example, um, so I, so I teach classes like community health, health inequities, racial politics of teaching methods, which sounds kind of opaque, but is actually a really exciting class to teach. Um, so I took this example where um, I, the purpose of, of the task of the project was identify upstream factors in relation to different positionalities. It was a social theory class that had a community engagement component and I called it social biographies, and that really comes from Michael James and other scholar activists who worked with Sarah and Margot. Um, and the task is they had to identify a social contradiction. Social contradiction meaning something was said one way and then they manifest the reality another way. So they had to find an example in their lives pre-COVID. Um, so maybe um, um, the uh, Disney concert hall, and then there were all these tents of housing insecure, like that was a contradiction, right? Um, and the task was to find these contradictions in the social theorists that we were reading. So that could be like Bourdieu or Gramsci or Thich Nhat Hanh. Three examples of events of a social contradiction in their own lives and then with our community partner. And so I have a picture of a tree here. This isn't the tree of my students because I'm not going to campus, but it's in my office. But they basically took wires and they created a wire tree. And then they, they created leaves that they dangled that were different examples of the events of social contradictions of each of the parties or social things. And then they, they 
color coded it, made the material similar, different. And they had some leaves falling to sort of show that it was dynamic over time intergenerationally. So that was an example of problem posing in the sense of they understood themselves, they understood the theorists, the community partner, and the ways that they related and interacted with each other. <clears throat> Another example, um, let's see. So that was sort of a larger scale assignment. So we did like four or five weeks of reading, discussion, and this was sort of the, the big assessment or the equivalent of an exam. To give you smaller scale examples, um, was I might do warm up prompts. So like what we practice today, what inspires you? I might have a prompt of who are your ancestors to communities that you feel comfortable sharing that you would like to bring in the room. We might change our name up in the top right corner. We might have people bring in an object that represents community or what a sense of belonging means to you. Um, we've done movement based things and also music things like we've done Spotify playlists that represent a social contradiction. contradiction. Other examples I've done um, for variations of problem posing that isn't just the scale of an exam, but could be done across disciplines is maybe they've done a portrait of their self, their communities and strengths and challenges, but you can see the commonalities of, of weaving people in context. It's about context and relationality that is both past, present and future. I'm going to pause there for questions or comments put in the chat or unmute, and then I think we're gearing up for a break. I was just going to share that I'm teaching this archaeology and society class um, at Pomona, and in really thinking about this type of work and this environment, I decided to introduce an archeological drawing unit that threads through the whole class. And um, so I was able to have an expert Skype in and give the students a workshop on drawing. I, I organized a supplies list so they would all have the same like equipment. And then I, I had to let go of some other parts of the syllabus because I did not, it's, it's not an add on, right? <laughs> it's not, it's not an extra thing they have to do in addition to all the normal stuff, right? And um, first I invited them to break a cup so that they could do a rim drawing. And now they're working on a precious object or something that, that that could be like an heirloom, if not already, but you know, something they that matters to them that they might want to see like passed down. And I scaffold the assignment so that they're posting on their blogs, not just the final pro product, but like or project, but like why they chose the object and what it means to them. And I really encourage them to do video or audio um, logs for those posts with maybe photos of the objects. And that class, the students have just come so alive in that class because they're watching these videos of each other talk about like, like one of the guys in the class who was very reserved at first and just very um, kind of skeptical, I think a little bit of the class. Like he broke a pot that he had made as a child and it was this whole process for him of like, it was, he said it was like a little hard, but then through that process, he like really reconnected with it. And um, I was then simultaneously posting pictures of my son who broke our, my pot. Mm. And this like whole thing just started to happen in the class. And yeah, I just wanted to share out that I felt a little nervous doing it. I'm not a, an artist. I'm not an archeological illustrator professionally or even as a hobby. <laughs> and you know, as faculty, it's so hard to let go of that. I'm the expert. I have to only teach about things that I have expertise in, you know, blah, 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 blah. You know? <laughs> and it's like, I mean, the students are like, oh, are you doing this with us? And I'm like, yeah. Yeah, no, I'm with you in this. Like, I don't, I'm learning too. And they're like, you are, you're like doing this with us. And I'm like, no, I'm doing this with you. 
And it was helpful because then I could ask our expert when she comes to visit questions, you know, like, well, I had trouble with going from 3D to 2D, like with some of the patterns on my cup. And it was a real question. I'm not pretending, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> Jody, that was incredible. I see all these head nods, I see the smiles. And, and I, I just wrote in the chat, I am doing this with you, right? And, and when we think of that, we can think of that just in a downstream way. Like I'm, I'm here with you, I'm, I'm upset too. And, it, but I think what's really powerful is your story is an upstream way of like, we are shifting who's co-creating knowledge and, co and, and also stre taking stretch, stretching and risking together. And that is a huge, not only signal and signifier, but also for us too, as our trajectory is of, of teaching and learning. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to invite us to take a quick break. We're at 1056 um, and let's come back at 1058. Um, the literature is really compelling about it's important to not sit for more than 30 minutes. It impacts our lifespan, our quality of life, maybe on a more unicorn and bunny happier note, like touch the trees, feel the sun, and we'll come back. I, mean, I took up tons of time. 10.59. Let's do two minutes. 10.59. So thank you, and I'll see you back in two minutes. Well, welcome back. Welcome back. So we've talked conceptually, not racist versus anti-racist, upstream, downstream. We had a chance to check in about those concepts, but also the meaning, meaning making of them within our context. We talked about the example of an actionable pedagogy of, um, of problem posing. And then now we're, we're gonna focus on the second one, which is dialogical or dialogue. Um, and I'm going to talk about the concept through a quote and then also give you some, some short examples. Um, so let's do this. Okay. <clears throat> so here's a quote from Dr. Gwen Kirk. Um, she, we're so lucky. She's working and learning from my class, Social Theory of Thich Nhat Hanh this semester. And we have a couple of sessions and this came through in our conversation and presentation. So just take a moment with the quote. Um, you can read it, see how it lands for you. And here, Dr. Kirk is really talking about or inviting us to consider that there's different kinds of knowledge creation. Um, and again, this is about epistemology and it intersects with ontology, the different lived experiences people have. And that this act of teaching and learning involves relationality with ourselves, with the text, with the other people in the class, with our community partners, if we're doing a community partner based one. So it's less around a debate around a topic or an idea, but it's both engaging with the topic and the idea of the concept as well as the relationships with each other. Um, so examples are, and Carlos and Leah and Barbara and um, Linda, if you wanna chime in about this as well, is um, we have established sort of these practices and principles of being seen and heard. And this comes from Thich Nhat Hanh, this comes from Julian Weisglass and others, um, Nancy Luna Jimenez. And the purpose is to nurse care and context. Right, so deepening trust and receiving the social ecology of the class or the institution, and we're developing meaning-making skills, meaning that it isn't just knowledge um, uh, taking in and then recreating, it's actually the actual original act of knowledge production. Um, so the context is, I've done this in almost every class, I teach interdisciplinary, calling it seeing her dyads, and students learn, um, well, um, we, step back. I have a grading rubric that is featuring dialogue. It isn't necessarily about an articulation of identifying a definition. It's actually the process of facilitating. Um, so it's a time to listening activity. So let's say each person gets two minutes and then everyone has the role of speaker and learner and then they reflect on it. Um, and then I did this on a wider scale for the college and we did this to diversity committee. 
in every meeting. And then also um, for broader things, like we had monthly workshops, we had day long trainings with all different stakeholders. So variations is you can do this very quickly at the beginning of every class or meeting. And I put 10 minutes, but we've done this in five minutes and everyone gets to speak and everyone gets to be heard. And that shifts some of the upstream factors and the cumulative effects of cultural mistrust or institutional mistrust or oppressions that violence and marginalize. Um, students have facilitated outside of class. So they've done the scene or heard and then they reflect on it for an assignment. Students have created curricular materials way better than me. They've done like drawings, they've done like playlists to help people learn how to do these um, dialogical dyads. And then I've done a full exam. So I've done small assignments that is just standalone. I've done small assignments that build to a larger um, exam and grading rubric. Um, what I will say, and I think we are talking about this in relation to the upcoming election, is this dialogical framing as well as technique was really important as a reactive pedagogy. Um, so it was important as a proactive to seed that practice of everyone speaks and everyone's heard, but it also is important for rapid response. And this is when there were alleged bias incidents on campus where it was going to go through the administrative mechanism, but that was unsatisfying on many levels of finding the perpetrator. Was it an actual violation of student code? And then coming up with some kind of either punitive or some kind of um, mechanism to repair the harm, that this mechanism of seen and heard in dialogue allowed spaces for people to make meaning of the social contradiction that happened in the classroom, you know, in the dining hall, et cetera, or in the world. This also was very useful when um, students, staff, and faculty were receiving death threats, right? And there was that period where um, the Cornell College is, is for you as recall, that we were sort of fish in a barrel for, for particular communities and then um, student deaths that were, were sort of correlated and related to that. The federal elections that happened last time, it was it was important for us to already have a set of skills to have not only a place of care, but also a place of agency and resilience and power in the context of people being afraid that their family was going to be incarcerated or hunted down incarcerated. And that was what came to pass for some people. This also was important. And that, I won't go through each example, but there's these were the, the, the landscape in which there were upstream factors shaping interactions or conflicts that were happening on campus or in class and that we had these set of skills so we could call it up when things happened but we also kept on practicing and it was like a muscle that you keep on building just like any other critical analytical skill so let me check in with you all would you all like the dial the the pairing right now in a in breakout rooms, would you like a larger group? What, what, what's your feeling knowing that we have about 25 more minutes left? And maybe we could put in the chat, like, let's go breakout rooms, let's stay in a larger group. What would y'all like to do? So let's, let's do large group. What's next on my agenda? We're gonna do a flash mob. No, um, <laughs> so the, the next on the agenda was we were gonna break into small groups and look at the Google Doc and then come back as a large group. Um, so I think what I'm seeing is large groups. So if you could take an opportunity just to go back to the Google Doc um, and um, ignore the time. So we're past the break or in this section, I'll share screen so you can see it as well. Um, and maybe just take a, a moment or two to reflect on the dialogue piece and maybe these questions. I re-put in the quotes and then we'll just open it up for a large discussion. Take a moment or two, look at the prompt, take in what was shared. I 
And you're welcome to type in responses at the end there if you'd like. After that section, there's an area where if we've gone into pairs or groups, take notes here. And we'll have a few minutes just to reflect and engage individually, and then we'll form together as a large group. a few more minutes. Can I ask a question? Of course. No, no questions. Yes, of course. I'm looking at the problem pose and dialogue, and I'm having trouble understanding the difference. I guess I think all problems can be can turn into dialogue. That's such a great comment. Um, I have an initial response, but I want to open up because we have a lot of amazing critical pedagogy folks here. The other folks want to chime in of initial sort of reaction and and connecting with Julie's question of in what ways are problem posing and dialogue similar and then can be different in your experiences or in your practices or in conceptually. And you're welcome to unmute and respond. So it's a great question. I can try to respond to that a little bit. Um, my name is Andre, I'm a doc student. Um, I think what's really challenging is actually sometimes you might be able to problem pose but or have dial dialogue, but you actually do it um, like with a positivist mind. So a lot of times qualitative researchers will actually approach qualitative inquiry with a quantitative lens. And I think that's the same parallel I have for pedagogy. When you're thinking about problem-based work, you can attempt to do the work cognitively, but if it's bifurcated from the body, the mind, and the emotions, then essentially your, your onto epistemology is um, still very positivist and Western, Western Eurocentric, and that doesn't align with the transformative liberatory project. I'll pause there. Andre, that was amazing, thank you. Will you teach the rest of my classes? <laughs> so I think that it's sort of thinking about the transactional versus the relational, sort of building upon what Andre is saying. So if it's a transactional approach, it can be sort of amplifying what Andre is saying is it could be a topic of study. And you can still get at the ways in which um, social determinants of educational outcomes, where we work, live, and play impact graduation rates. And you can still completely dehumanize and marginalize the populations you study. Right? So you could say, fill out the survey. I don't need to know your name. Thank you. Here's your gift card. And we're done. And there's no community report out. There's no... Um, co-creating of what the purpose is, right? Now, I'm not saying one is better than the other. I'm just trying to draw the distinction. So I think Gwen Kirk, who is a sociologist, she also 
works on uh, a women peace network across the global world. She was so interesting because she talked about the head, the heart, and the body. And I, I had some amazing students in the class who are math majors, who are engineers, and like, what role does my heart <laughs> have to play? And are we going to be graded on having to be the heart? And it just took a lot of steps of the rubric is how do we fully show up in different ways? Um, and it, it's taken us a long time to get there. So now I've wandered off into little stories, but I, I want to just return to Andre's answer of thinking about it's also the way that we approach things and then also what is the goal. Um, so yes, thank you. Oh, Andre has a source too. Thank you, Andre. Um, and other people comment, Jessica, were you gonna have a comment in relation to this thread? Uh, anyone else? Barbara, I know you've been tackling with these experiences with different kinds of teaching situations you're in. Did you want to chime in? No. Mm, yeah. Oh, so I'm sorry, everybody. I came a little bit late. I was teaching. Um, I, I just had, this is really, I mean, we were just talking about the, all these things in my class about it, my students aren't saying transactional, but they're struggling a little bit right now because they keep asking me, what do you want, Barbara? What, 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 what am I supposed to be doing? How will I, you know, like they feel very stressed out and I keep talk, trying to talk about we're wandering through things together. Um, like, it's the conversation, not the end point. And also I'm trying to get them to think beyond transaction, like it's dialogue among us. And so we have been spending a lot of time in class, just building relationships and trust and grounding. And I know some students are resisting it because they feel like it's wasting their time and other students really need it and are very lonely and appreciate it. So actually I'm struggling right now as I always do <laughs> with these two very, so I did a little survey <laughs> surveys, and I said, don't include your name, <laughs> don't put your name down. <laughs> But I, so I, I use the survey as a way, like, what's going well? How can I support you? How can we support each other? And, and the response is some students were like, I don't want to spend so much time talking. Can't we do some written activities? And other students are like, I don't want to write. I just want to talk. And some students are like, I want to have my Zoom camera off. I, I, I need privacy. And others are like, I hate when the Zoom camera is off because I can't, I feel like I'm exposing myself and others aren't taking the risk. And so I think like I'm really excited because I'm going to start class on Friday with a conversation about what is this that we're doing together. And I, I try to have it in different ways. I, I feel often that I'm not I don't have the language or the skills to do it smoothly, but maybe that's OK, too, because I myself, I'm always telling them, like, this is something I've never done before either. So we'll do it together. And then also, finally, my last thing, I guess I'm not really giving helpful things but one thing is like they keep wanting to talk about grades and I keep saying you get to grade yourself <laughs> on like how much energy you had and how much you put into it and how you know how, in the moment when you were with your peers doing the work together and talking with each other how present were you I said those will be your your and I, I don't know I'm sorry I I'm, I think I'm still in my mind in my previous in my class Thanks, Kathy, for asking me. <laughs> this was so helpful, and I have a response, but I don't. I don't want to take up space. So if anyone else like does anything, sort of, Leah, yes, Leah, you're still muted, Leah. There. Okay, so this is basically what I put in my end comment on the Google Doc, and it's something that I struggle with too. And so I'm thinking that. Um, and I, and Barbara, I hear you because like, I don't want to be in charge. I, I, I mean, <laughs> I do, but I want to give my students the reading, the perfect reading that says, this is what this is. And so that I can just say, hey, we're just doing what that reading told us to do. <laughs> um, <laughs> and yeah. So that's what I want to say is that I want to find the perfect reading that says this is what this is and then I give it to them and then when they complain that we're not doing something that's academic that I say oh yes we are we had you had that reading that reading was the thing <laughs> and that's what we're doing. Mary. 
Yeah, I think I, I love your comments, Barbara, because I have those same struggles. And when I do surveys, I kind of crack up at the, I want this, I don't want this. Um, I had my students help me craft my mid-semester survey. Like I'd given a pre-survey that had a lot of self-care stuff. And then I asked them for other questions. Um, and then today I did the report out and I was just really honest with some of you are really frustrated that some people aren't having their camera on, but others of you are really frustrated that you have to have, like, you know, they appreciate it's not on for privacy. And I'm trying to let them see, like, there's a whole bunch of different people here and I want to give you different ways. And I find that my students are just, I, I teach all first years in general chemistry. I, mean, I a, a couple sophomores snuck in. I didn't know they were sophomores, but it's supposed to be all first years. And so they are just they're starving for community. So I have these asynchronous like drop in chat things where they can ask chemistry questions or we'll just talk about whatever they want to talk about and they're packed, right? And so I I get that thing where they're like I don't want to take class time on this, but they they are just desperate for that community. I'm constantly amazed. I'll be like, "Okay, we're going to do an asynchronous at, or a synchronous thing at 8 in the morning." before class <laughs> and they're packed because they're just like, yay, let's talk about my dog or whatever. And so I think some of that is, is this is a, such a weird time. They're not getting to do that elsewhere. And we have to help those who are, you know, I have those who are super stressed and it's just like, I must learn this chemistry and there's a grade and it'll go on my medical application. So stop this waste of time. Um, but I have to remind those students like, we need community and chemistry is hard and, and we should do that in community and we'll all be happier. The other thing I was going to say is what your quotes meant to me is when we talk about what prevents understanding, and I put this in the comments, for my students, it's their positionality. So many of my students come in with, well, I can't be a scientist because I'm a person of color or I'm low income or I'm a woman or I had a math teacher who told me I'm not good at this. And so I really like I treat the first semester as a way to yes I'll teach you some tools but what I'm going to do is try to undo the damage that society did to you so you can know what you're doing next semester, which is why I'm desperate to get rid of the grades in the first semester hasn't worked yet but I think at least letting them know that right like I've had students in office hours who are just like, but, 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 but I can't and I say okay we're going to practice mindfulness like that thinking that you can't do this somebody else put that in your head that's not your belief that's society's belief so you go yep that's there move away. I'm going to work on this problem. Right. And it's, but it's a lot of work and these poor kids, like, I got to say, I'm glad I'm old because there wasn't this much pressure <laughs> when I, you know, I could learn science and make mistakes and I was still going to get into college or still going to get into grad school. And the pressure is just way too much. And I don't need to see your speak a little bit to what um, Barbara and Leah and Mary said, which is that, you know, I teach in like classics <laughs> So for example, one of my job assignments right now is to teach a Latin class. And, um, you know, I've been teaching the same class for about maybe 10 years around Claremont here and there, you know, and I'm a contract faculty. So I've been at Scripps. I've been at Pitzer. Hi, Pitzer. Um, I'm at Pomona right now. But this class, it, it did not travel with me to Pitzer, but it, it, I've had it at Scripps, I've had it at Pomona, you know, and as a contract faculty, in some ways, it's like, I try to do a little what I'm told, I try to, whatever, but then I'm like, fuck it, I'm teaching Virgil again, like, this is my class now, and I started out sort of like soft feminist with the with the Virgil class and now I went full intersectionality this semester, I told the students I said what we're going to do is we're going to figure out how and if it's possible and how an intersectional reading of book four of the Aeneid in Latin is possible, helpful, and meaningful. We're just going to give it a whirl. <laughs> they were like, okay, you know. And then just to speak to what you were saying, Leah, I actually do give them, just like what Kathy gave us today, quotes and citations and informations about what we're doing. So this is why we do intersectionality. Here's some stuff from the social sciences, you know, by the originators of that. This is not, has nothing to do with Latin. It's not even written for humanists, like, or humanities people, like, but we need to, we need to know. And then I gave them a quiz and I gave them all these quotes from this book called Make It Stick. And I was like, this is why you're writing a quiz because mentally, cognitively, here's what it does to your brain parts. It makes you recall things in a different way. The quizzes were credit, no credit, and I corrected them. It was painful for me, but whatever, you know. So, so they knew that that it's it's graded, but 
purely for credit was I was crystal clear about it. Like you do it. And then I don't have to worry about like, are they cheating? And I mean, I wrote a little thing about how utterly pointless it would be for them to cheat because the entire point of the quiz was for them to learn because it's shown that that kind of information retrieval is beneficial to their learning. And that, you know, it would be great for them to put their best effort into it because why not? It's more satisfying, you know, or what, I, you know, and I do, I've just, uh, over the years, I have just gone full frontal with it. It's like, I used to feel like, oh, I'm not supposed to be teaching them neuroscience. Oh, I'm not supposed to be teaching them about pedagogy. That's not my job. I'm not supposed to be teaching them about um, intersectionality. No one signed up for that. I'm obligated to teach them intermediate Latin because that's what they signed up for. Well, I lay it all out for them on the first day. And then I say, you know, if this isn't the right class for you, I totally understand. <laughs> But this is what we're actually going to be doing in here. And you're going to read a shit ton of Latin and your grammar is going to get really good. And I'm going to bust out with all these weird esoteric grammatical things that are buried deep in the recesses of my brain. And we're going to laugh about it together. Like, here we are. Like, this and is. Jody, I wish I'd had you. I was the treasurer of the Latin club of Jordan Middle School. And I probably would have continued if I had you, like, as a teacher. So, and I, I love that. And we're going to do a shit ton of Latin. <laughs> Okay. And that, you know, I say to them all the time, Kathy, I'm like, you know what, maybe we move a little slow in this class because we pause for a long time to talk about the like systemic misogyny and the um, like uh, uh, resources that we're using to translate the ones that tell us that like the leader, the word leader has to go with Aeneas and it cannot go with Dido because Dido's female. And yeah, we're going to talk about that for 15 minutes, but guess what? That's okay because if you're actually still interested in Latin and you want to continue with it after this class, that's more important to me than that we read 50 lines of Latin on Thursday, you know? And, like, I always like done, to joke with them. I'm like, the greatest thing about studying antiquity is not going. It'll still be here next week, just like the <laughs> pandemic. <laughs> like and, it's, and I just put it all forward now I don't try to be I just I do I like you were saying Leah I actually ha have them read stuff about pedagogy in the Latin class so that they can understand too it's also heartening to them I'm like maybe you're taking this to fulfill your language requirement boom welcome to the class let's work and, on your neurological networks like fine so, so, you know so Jody, I'm gonna Jody, you're amazing. I'm going to cut in because we've got yeah, only sorry. four minutes left. But what I will say is, is you said something really important there. Is, and, and maybe in a gentle nudge of reframing it, it isn't just to go slow and it's throwing something out. It's actually a pivot and enriching and deepening. And it's actually bringing in the different disciplines. And I don't mean that just as like, I don't know, my brother, like here, give me your nickel for two pennies. You get two things and you get one. It's not like that. It's actually a substantive thing because what Barbara talked about, what Leo, what Jody and what other people have put in the chat and the chat is really rich, like Andre's putting resources and stuff, is that we're actually trying liberation. We are, un and what Mary said, we are undoing apparatus hegemony. We are undoing the ways in which we have been projects for something that is dehumanizing and actually exterminating people. And I don't mean that in a light way, but I, the stakes are very high. And so when students have resistance or staff or faculty administrators, external reviewers, it's because it's what we've been conditioned to do. And so when we open up these spaces of liberation, it is, can be terrifying. There can be a lot of resistance. I've been called to the Dean's office so many times, right? And so I actually wrote about it. I have a couple pieces of, I created an archetype of different kinds of students' resistance to this kind of dialogue, to this invitation of humanity. Humanity in the context of historical trauma and intergenerational. And I've written about my own historical trauma as a first gen woman in my family to go to college. Like, what does that mean to be the first person hired at the Claremont Colleges with a PhD in ethnic studies? Right? And, and in Asian American studies where in the racial triangulation, we're not seen as a real ethnic studies by certain people, right? Do you see what I mean? So I think this ways in which we make visible to ourselves in community with other people and with our students, and I don't mean just like trauma porn, but I mean it in a way of, this is a hard project. And in these times, the stakes are really high. I opened up with 
the federal executive order. I'm not even sure if we can do this workshop. According to this, the University of Iowa is halting all trainings so they can clarify. So if we had that same policy, that's we may have halted this, right? So the stakes are really high. Um, it is 11.28. I wish we had more time together. We have um, the Praxis slide, and I'll share the slides, talks about this, this component of reflection and action, reflection and action. And that gets to Leah's question, comment, sharing of a text, and then action. And what is that in between, right? Because we can read something, like Bell Hooks talks about ways of knowing and ways of being, but then how do we practice it when our muscles and our brains and our bodies have been so trained to do a certain thing? Um, oh, we have one minute. Okay, why don't we take a moment to think about um, everything? Oh, okay, let's see. Here's a recap slide. <laughs> um, so we've talked about, here's an outcome slide and I'll share it you later. It, it's a lot of what students talked about is their reactions to this, but I'll share it with you later. Um, so we talked about not racist versus anti-racist and anti-racist thinking about that in terms of critical conscious and social action. And critical conscious social action is sort of these upstream factors, the social condition, conditions, as well as individual strategies and then actionable pedagogies. And what I will say is um, this is the beginning of a conversation or reflection. I love that we had a chance to hear from different people and react. So if you could return to the Google Doc, um, and go to the close, I would love for you to select one prompt and reflect on it and write one or two sentences. You can add a prompt if you wish, but I purposely put something I learned, a, a question, which is I wonder, or I commit to, like here's an action item, right? And I appreciate it could be for yourself or for the other people on this call, it could be for CTL for continuing to hold space in this way. Um, and it, it's optional in terms of whether you reveal your name, um, but I would love for to kind of close and I'm sorry, we're gonna go over a minute or two. Um, but I think it's important that so much gets kicked up and I don't know if you sometimes walk out of meetings or things and you're like kicked up, but like, what did I, what am I taking away? What am I questioning? What am I committing to do? Kathy, there's a, um, Julia's um, asking, or Jody, sorry, is asking if um, you'd be willing to share the slides uh, from the presentation. Absolutely. And as we wrap up, and I know you're still thinking and, and, and writing, I want to also honor the commitment of time. I just want to thank Warren for co-drawing with me in terms of thinking as in the technology piece. I want to thank Jessica and Mary and Sarah from CTL for really, really being so intentional with the multiple spaces. And thank you all for attending and co-facilitating like in the chat and adding things. My hope is that um, my sense of CTL has the list so that these conversations can continue and maybe sort of amplify Julie's phrase, like I found my people, like here's my community, we'll continue to build that towards each other. And um, as we continue to travel on this project together, just may we have kindness and compassion for ourselves and others, but may we continue to, to commit with resilience to this vision of ways in which the all can thrive, that all can be at ease. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you so much.